So welcome everybody. Welcome to our webinar today on five steps to good management of your churchyard or burial ground. This is one of 12 webinars we've got going on this week, all themed around land and nature. Uh, it's currently Churches Count on Nature, and hopefully you know already there's more than 300 churches all around the country taking part in Churches Count on Nature, going out into their churchyards and recording the plants and the intra insects and the birds that they find there. And in parallel with Churches Count on Nature, nationally at the Church of England, we're running this programme of webinars all about land and nature. Um, let me click on here and get us going. So quick bits of housekeeping if you haven't been to one of these webinars before. So we'll be using the Q&A for questions rather than the chat. Uh, so please do find the Q&A, pop in your question, and also you can click thumbs up next to other people's questions if you think it's a really good one, and then that one will rise to the top. After today, I'll send you the slides, and I'll send you the links from the chat, and I'll send you a link through to our feedback form. So please do make notes, but don't feel you have to write down everything because you'll be getting the slides. And we're also recording the webinar, and it'll go on our website in a few days' time. We're doing this one in a slightly different way than the others because of nervousness about uh, Wi-Fi quality from darkest Gloucestershire. Um, Andrea has been really organized and has pre-recorded the PowerPoint with her voiceover. So what we'll do first is we'll play that pre-recorded PowerPoint um, to you all. And that takes, I think it's about 15 minutes, isn't it? And then there'll be plenty of time at the end for questions. So please do pop your questions in the Q&A. I always begin with trailers of upcoming attractions. So these are the remaining webinars going on this week. Uh, and there's some brilliant things on there. So please do, you know, skim down and spot some webinars that you think you'll want to come along to. And I'll put the link through to the webinar program in the chat later. And then on Saturday, Sheffield Diocese is hosting an online eco church festival linked to Churches Count on Nature. And you're very welcome to sign up to that. And I'll put a link through to the Sheffield event in the chat as well. And then webinars uh, on other topics, looking a little bit further forward. We've got one coming up on heat pumps on the 13th of July. We've got three eco church webinars coming up toward end of June, beginning of July on getting started, maintaining momentum and how it links with net zero carbon. And then we've got our two fundraising webinars in September, the first on what environmental funding opportunities there are and the second on how to start fundraising. Right, let's get to the main event. Um, you might well know who I am if you've been to one of the other webinars. I'm Catherine Ross and I'm part of the staff team behind the Church of England Environment Programme. I'm based in the Cathedral and Church Buildings Division. But more importantly, Andrea Gilpin from Caring for God's Acre. Uh, this is her absolute bread and butter. Andrea knows all about how to advise people in managing their burial ground. Um, and uh, she is an ecologist by background and we'll be able to tell you how to start and what you need to know to start managing your uh, burial ground or churchyard for nature and wildlife. Right, I will stop getting that screen and then find uh, Andrea's PowerPoints. That's where I hope my computer would do this slightly faster, but here we go. Right, here is Andrew's PowerPoint. Share my screen. Remember to tick the important box to say share sound. Go into there, and then when I have the slide shown, Andrew, if you give me a thumbs up when everything's working okay from your end, I'll know that it's a all go. It always takes a few seconds to uh, gear up into action. Welcome to this five steps webinar with a focus on how to create a roadmap for the management of your churchyard. This will help you produce a plan that is suitable for your site and realistic for your resources. Yeah, it's frozen, Catherine, yeah. and there was lots of interference. 
Ah, right. Let me see. I'm Andrea and I work for Karen for Gorsaker. The charity. Can anybody else hear interference or is it just me? In this talk, we'll be covering the method we use at Karen for Gorsaker when we work with communities to plan the management of a churchyard or burial ground. To begin with, it's worth remembering that burial grounds are quite The second one was a bit better. Uh, most people are hearing um, a bit of crackling. Yeah. Right. I'm going to try stopping it and starting it again. Crossing my fingers that that makes a difference. And then I just won't click on anything else and we'll see if it goes okay. Right, screen two, no, hang on. Sorry about this, give me a few seconds just to... Complex error. Let's come out of that. We'll share my screen again. We did practice this before, I assure you. Right, we'll share that. Go slideshow from beginning. Welcome to this Five Steps webinar, which will focus on how to create a roadmap for the management of your churchyard. This will help you produce a plan that is suitable for your site and realistic for your resources. I'm Andrea and I work for Karen for Gorsaker, the charity dedicated to the conservation of all burial grounds. We work towards these sites being beautiful, welcoming and connected to their communities. We're a national charity covering England and Wales and 2020 was our 20th anniversary. We focus on the conservation of natural, built and social heritage and support burial grounds of all types and sizes, ranging from rural, church or chapel yards to green burial sites and urban cemeteries. In this talk, we'll be covering the method we use at Karen for Gorsaker when we work with communities to plan the management of a churchyard or burial ground. To begin with, it's worth remembering that burial grounds are quite complex areas to manage. Firstly, they have a variety of functions, weddings, fates, funerals, places of relaxation and remembrance, places for people to pass through on the way to work or sit in for a lunch break. Secondly, they have a wide variety of unique, often irreplaceable heritage, from rare species to scheduled monuments. And lastly, their places nestled in the hearts of communities where people have a wide variety of expectations on how they should look and be managed. Our aim is to help you feel less like this and more like this, following a plan with everyone signed up to a clear vision and working together to tackle jobs proactively. To help break it down into manageable chunks, we think of it as five steps. One, research your site. Two, create a map. Three, plan what you want to do. Four, inform and invite people to be involved. Five, review how it's all going and celebrate. So step one, research. This step shouldn't take too long. It's just about finding out what is already known about your site. For the natural environment, some burial grounds have special protection, such as being a site of special scientific interest, a wildlife site, or a site of nature importance. These vary from county to county, and they give an indication of whether there are features recognised as rare or of particular interest. Your burial ground may also contain protected species such as bats, great crested newts or slow worms. To find out if you have a designation, contact your local authority or your local wildlife trust. If your site is Anglican, check the churchyard pages on the Church Heritage Record site or the Church Heritage Cymru site for information on designations and protected species. Remember though, even though a species might not be recorded, you can't assume it's absent. For the built environment, there are a range of designations covering things ranging from individual monuments to archaeological sites. 
burial grounds may be within wider heritage designations such as a conservation area. Consult the Church Heritage Record or Church Heritage Cymru again for designations and listings. Alternatively, go direct to Historic England or Cadw for the same information. This information can be really useful when planning interpretation such as leaflets and displays. Many groups already know this information, so just simply gather this together for it to be ready to be considered in your management planning. Changing management can have an impact on many different species, so it's really good to find out what wildlife has been recorded in your burial ground to date. It is likely that, at one time or another, someone has undertaken a survey of the plants in your burial ground. For example, I think it was in the 70s that the Women's Institute undertook a survey of the plants in churchyards across England and Wales. And you may have this survey already, or you might be able to con contact the Women's Institute if not. The British Lichen Society has surveyed most churchyards in England and Wales, and they can also give you some records. There is likely to be many local people who will tell you what wildlife they have seen over the years. Your local record centre may also have records and you can find out who's running your local record centre by contacting the Wildlife Trust. We're working with the National Biodiversity Network and other organisations to collate all records onto one system which is here. So if you search for your burial ground on this database you will find a list of species that have been recorded and the dates that they were seen. So, for example, I popped York Cemetery in the search bar of this database and came up with the following information. A map, along with a list of 98 species that have been recorded there and the date they were recorded. So in 2011, there were meadow grasshoppers spotted, an adder was spotted in 2012, 38 plants were listed in 2019, along with a hedgehog, wood mouse and various bat species. So this is really interesting and relevant information that York Cemetery could put into their management brief and take into account when planning their management. The database is being tweaked at the moment and we're still waiting for a few more geographical areas to be uploaded. So it must may be best to pop back if your site isn't showing at the moment. We'll be running a webinar on wildlife recording and how to use this database soon, so I won't get into detail here. So step two is to create a base map. Many sites already have an existing map, but if not, you can draw one by going onto the internet. So for example, the top two are maps from a simple search on Google. The bottom left is from the Church in Wales, Church Heritage Cymru site, and the bottom right is the Church of England's Church Heritage Records website. Once you have this, then make a few copies so that it can be used for varying purposes, and if possible, scan it so that it is easy to email around. Then everyone will be working on the same map. Once you've used the online map to create a base map of your own, it's time to mark things on, such as entrances, boundaries, paths and building footprint, orientation, trees, permanent shrubs, current compost area, listed structures. You can use the information that you gained in step one when you did the research. Also mark on areas of current use. Where do new burials take place? Do you have our outdoor marquees? And if so, where do these go? Or mark on the existing management. Where do you currently have short grass, long grass and areas that may be a bit neglected? Now it's on to step three, where you plan what you want to do. Now you've gathered information and marked it on your base map, it's time to plan. It's important to involve more people at this stage. A plan drawn up by several people is more likely to succeed. It is always good to agree on a vision for your management plan. For example, this burial ground is cared for in a way that makes it a special place for visitors, in keeping with its function of burials, a fit setting for the church and a haven for wildlife. Now, take your map and plan where. Which areas are suitable for particular management? Are there areas of unshaded grass that can be left to grow long? Are there areas where bramble is taken over and needs to be controlled? Are the needles on the yew tree turning brown to the, due to the grave spoil under it? Does it need to be removed? Do you need a designated compost area?
Next, you need to plan when. Once the management work has been agreed, produce a seasonal time scale for undertaking tasks. Plan what needs to be done each year as well as over the longer term. Three years works well. It can be easy to take on too much in the first year, so having a three-year plan helps prevent overwhelm. If you look at this three-year plan, they've identified that the wall repair needs doing sooner rather than later. Maybe it's a bit unstable. Also, they want to build the compost bins. When changing management, it's always good to think of the impact that has. So, for example, if you are wanting to encourage the wildflowers, then you need to pick up the grass clippings. Where are these going to go? Will it be off-site? Or do you need a new compost area? Step 4. Inform and invite people to be involved. Once you have your plan, then let the wider community know what you're doing. For example, pop up a poster in the porch, put an article in the parish magazine, put a laminated sign up, mention changes on social media and chat to visitors. With a plan, it is easier to organise work parties and delegate tasks. Any events or work parties do need a risk assessment and we have templates of the ones we use if you like them. In our experience, when groups let the wider community know that they are managing their site for wildlife as well as for people, they often find it much easier to engage more of the community. This is a great time to invite local people to tell you what they have seen in the burial ground. Have you got a botanist who can do a plant survey? Is there a bird enthusiast who can let you know what birds visit your site? This may also be a good time to run training sessions to give people the confidence to be involved. These could be on memorial recording, dry stone walling, plant identification or tree pruning. There's quite a few grants around for running training sessions for volunteers and we can discuss more about involving the community in the chat. We have a starter guide and a botanical companion that are really useful publications to help identify wildlife and can also be used to encourage others to record what they see. We can post you a starter guide for free and the botanical companion is free to download from our website or we can send you a hard copy for a small fee. A nice thing to do if you have a building is to pop a wildlife sighting book in it for people to add to. As the management improves, more wildlife will be seen in your site. Many people feel that they can't identify wildlife, but with a bit of guidance they soon realise they can, and writing them on, out on a list is really satisfying. The challenge can be to find as many species as possible, and if you think about it, most people can identify yew, oak, holly, buttercup, snowdrops, dandelion, daisy and ivy, and that's eight species straight away. In the Botanical Companion, we have a list of the most commonly found species in burial grounds, so that would be a really good start. Once people have attended an event, you can be sure that they will start looking at your site in a different way and be far more likely to join in when you have work party mornings. Always use these opportunities to show people your map and so they understand the direction that you're going and feel involved. They're also much more likely to become ambassadors for the work you're doing and help spread the word. So now we've come to step five, to review and celebrate. It's good to review your plan at the end of each year. After all, it's only a guide and can be changed if anything is not working. One way to do this is to ask the volunteers. How has the year gone? Were the tasks enjoyable? Have they got the tools they need? Is there any training that would be useful? Do you need to recruit more help? Any other ideas? Also review what visitors have said about the changes. But remember to always keep in perspective the negative comments that may be made by just a few people. Going back to the beginning of the talk, as we said, everyone has different expectations of how these special sites should look. Any negative comments of a vocal few should always be considered, but further discussion is needed to ensure these comments do not disproportionately change the direction of what the majority of people are really happy with. If you'd like to find out how we can support you managing your site, or if you're just generally interested in the fascinating heritage of churchyards and burial grounds, then pop to our website for free resources and mini films. 
Join our webinar series, which will start running again in the autumn. Tune in to our podcast, where we'll be visiting a wide variety of sites, ranging from small rural churchyards to large city cemeteries, spanning different cultures, religions and centuries. We'll be hearing from those who care for them, enjoy them and study them. Discover flower rich sites near you by visiting our burial grounds to inspire webpage where we're mapping sites that we'd recommend visiting in the summer months. Also, if you have a well managed place that you feel could be on this map, then do let us know. Sign up to our e-newsletter and do consider becoming a member. Like many charities, we're a membership organisation. So from as little as £2.50 a month, you can join us and receive a welcome pack, a biannual newsletter, early invitations to events, discounts on our materials, and of course, that feel good feeling that you're helping in the quest to ensure churchyards and burial grounds are kept beautiful and connected to their communities. Thank you for listening. You're muted. <laughs> I think after a year. Uh, I, all I had said was the tech worked, what a relief, but ironically I said it on mute. Thank you so much for that, Andrew. It's so practical, isn't it? It's just a really lovely practical int introduction to what people need to do. Uh, right, so we've got plenty of time for questions. Um, those of you listening in, so if you find the Q&A, type in the questions you've got there or click the thumbs up next to the questions that you see already and the ones that have the most ticks are the ones that we'll start with at the top of the list. So the first question there says from uh, Christina, please do you have any tips on how to engage a wide group of people in caring for our churchyards from an eco church perspective? So, so reaching out, trying to reach different parts of the community and get a, a wide group together. What wisdom do you have on that, Andrea? Okay, yes. Um, thank you for that. That's a really good question. Um, I think the key thing is, to begin with, if you're clear about what you want, what, what you and the community, the direction you want for your burial ground, then that's a really good strong starting point before involving the community in what you're doing. So that's why we kind of start with the five steps of gathering people together that have like that vested interest in your site and you know you can determine what that is, uh, how wide you go with that consultation process. Is it the PCC? Is it the PCC plus volunteers? Is it the wider community? I mean that's that's for you to decide but doing that and thinking what is our main aim for the site and how are we going to get there and then when you've got that which is the five steps then I think it's much easier to then reach out to the wider community and say hey we're managing this burial ground that's sensitive for um in a way that's sensitive to wildlife as well as people um we're wanting to increase bird nest sites so can you help us with that and it all feeds in all these things that you're asking all these things that you're celebrating about your site all feed in to um, your plan. It, it sort of emanates from your plan and feeds back. Um, I think in terms of um, engaging people, I mean, that's my, my first point, but in terms of engaging people, there's some kind of easy things that we find really work. First of all, join in with existing initiatives. So every month there's some initiative or other, there's uh, National Nest Book, Box Week, there's the Big Butterfly Count, there's the British Archaeologist Week, um, and also, of course, this week, Churches Count on Nature and Love Your Burial Ground Week. If you do events that tag on to an existing um, initiative that's already got momentum, the press are already talking about it, um, then I think that really helps people sort of stand up. It helps the press and, and listen to what you're saying, but it also helps the press run a little pre-feature maybe in the local magazine because they know that you're tuning into a national initiative. Also, for people who don't normally come to church, it makes them feel a bit more comfortable that, that, that this isn't a religious service, that you're asking them to join in because it's National Nest Box Week and your church yard is fab for birds. I think that's a really clear, easy ask for people who might be a bit reluctant to kind of cross over that kind of lich gate, that kind of thing. Um, another way to involve the wider community is, as well as doing the kind of linking with national initiatives, I would say is to reach out to existing groups. 
So, for example, tonight, um, straight after this webinar, I'm going to be meeting with the Brownies and Cubs. There's about 20 something of them in a very big churchyard. And we're going to be doing all sorts of things, including mainly this week, actually, uh, species identification. And then rather than just holding an, an event on its own, hoping people come along, um, I've got straight in there uh, with the brownies, with the, with the leaders, and also with the parents. And um, so that, that's the kind of thing. Schools as well, we've got an education pack um, that you can approach your primary school with um, on our website, that's free to download. And things like the Duke of Edinburgh Award, that's one way of engaging a wider, wider community in what you're doing. But again, it all stems from you need to know how you're managing and why you're managing your churchyard um, in order to make that message clear and that ask clear if you're saying Duke of Edinburgh come along, volunteers come along, that kind of thing. Um, so those are my top tips for that question. And in a lot of areas, there are existing wildlife groups aren't there so around here there's the wildlife trust there's the rspca has a local group so presumably if you if you reach out to those groups you've got people who might not be interested in in coming to church but are very interested in nature and wildlife yes yeah definitely um also sort of i mean also really low-key things like a play group asking if they want to tell you their picnic in the churchyard that kind of thing you know really low-key you don't have to do I think sometimes we put pressure on ourselves that we've got to do this big event to encourage people in, but sometimes it's just the small little things like our primary school always do Welly Wednesday and they always go through the churchyard. And, and because I've done a session with um, the, the playgroup leaders in the churchyard, they then do the same session and tweak it a bit year on year on year in through the different seasons with the playgroup, but it's ever so simple. It's really small things. And I think also drip, drip, drip is really important. So rather than build up to this event that you're suddenly going to do and then tell everybody about it, um, if you haven't been on their radar, the wider community that aren't really associated with your church much probably aren't going to come along. But if every month in the parish magazine you say about what you've been seeing in your churchyard, the fact that nest boxes have gone up, the fact that the memorials have been recorded or something's been repaired, if you just have a regular slot in on a Facebook group, on a website, or in your parish magazine, then it's that kind of, it's a bit like marketing, isn't it? You know, you're touching base continually with people. So then when you do have an event, they're much more likely to go, oh yeah, of course, yeah, I wanted to go along to the church because I've heard that they've got this, that, and the other. So do, do, don't underestimate that little and often as well when you're reaching out to the community. Well, very practical advice there. Um, oh, there's been 12 thumbs up next to this one. So Garth has asked, how do you balance attempts to rewild churchyards with the wishes of relatives of those buried there to see everything neat and tidy? That's a really important question, isn't it? It must come up all the time. Yeah, definitely. Um, so again, this comes down to be really clear about what you want uh, and what you're aiming for and how you're going to get there um, in terms of five steps. Um, I think. We need to be careful of terminology here. So I would personally never use the word rewilding. I think it's a bit like a red uh, rag to a bull. I mean, I'm sure Gartha just sort of mentioned that, but um, it has been used. It's basic rewilding is when you're introducing a key species that's been extinct from a habitat back into a habitat um, to change the ecology of it. It's a very specific ecological term. And if it's misused, people get up in arms because they're thinking wolves, fevers, everything, and, and just letting things go. And it is, rewilding is you just let it go, introduce a key species and see what happens. So it'd be really good not to use the word rewilding in any communication with the community, because that's not what we're doing. This is not a nature reserve. It is not you know, the savannah that needs to be regenerated. This is a churchyard that has been actively managed for generations, and it needs to be actively managed in order to maintain the biodiversity that it's got. So our kind of, the kind of way we would describe it, and when I work with churches, it's like, we are actively managing this churchyard in a way that's sensitive to both wildlife and people. Okay, boom, that is what we're doing. Okay, so that kind of makes everybody just sort of calm down straight away if they're kind of a bit, a bit kind of frightened about what you're going to do. Um, and put that on every communication you can, okay? So that, that's just like either at the beginning or the end, it's just a nice thing that you just infuse into your communication with everybody. The next thing is, it's not all about long grass. I think people think conservation, you've got to have long grass, but we really don't. It is brilliant and churchyards are fantastic. They, they, they've got the 3% remaining um, 
what is it, species rich grassland in the UK, most of that, a lot of that is in churchyards. So yes, leaving it grow long is great, but you can start with a tiny, tiny little area and just grow, you know, grow year by year. Never leave a massive area that gets left, it looks unkept, people complain. Uh, there's specific ways of changing your grassland management regime. And we'll be going into that, I think it's tomorrow, isn't it, Catherine? Mm -hmm. We'll be going into that tomorrow, so I won't go too much into it today, um, because short grass has benefit for, for ground feeding birds. Medium grass is a great height to do, which is just 10 centimetres. That's got a lot of benefit for, for nature. And then, of course, long grass. Um, so it's not all about long grass. There's all sorts of things like swifts and hedgehogs and all sorts. Um, and if sometimes sites just aren't appropriate to have long grass, and that's fine. Uh, and if you have got a community that's quite resistant then, then, and you do want to change the management uh, of your cutting, then maybe just start off with some easy hits first, start off with some bug hotels discreetly, start off with nest box, don't go right in there with loads of long grass because it, it is quite a tricky one to win hearts and minds to begin with, just slowly, slowly. But like I say, tomorrow we're really going to the ins and outs of how to manage grassland in a way that really balances people and wildlife. So I won't go too much into that here, if that's okay. I'm going to make sure i've got your phrase correctly and then put it in the chat i think you said we are actively managing our churchyard for people and wildlife yeah Maybe people and nature yeah so yeah we are actively managing our churchyard for um people and wildlife that kind right. of thing i'm putting that in the chat that sounds like such a useful thing just to have that phrase in your mind to use um and i'll also put the link again to the webinars this week so the one that you're looking for is called blooming and beautiful and that is on four o'clock tomorrow if you want to come along to that one all about the um uh, little flower rich grasslands and, and the key key really is basically we never in terms of what we advise is we never advise any long grass near these graves that are being visited just keep it short don't go there um, always have, if you have got long grass, always have paths through it um, and always, always have signs saying that this grass is being left between, you know, between April and June for this reason and it will be cut in August, you know, or July and, and just have a little, you don't need a faculty for it, it's just a post with a laminated piece of A4, pop that up um, and if you want the, some text for that then just email me andrea at cfga.org uk and i'll send you text that we use for example and you can tweak it for you but it's about communication 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 because if you are telling people what you're doing while you're doing it then you're much much less likely to get complaints um so that's the key thing is communication so that suggestion came up in one of yesterday's webinars as well is there any standard signage somewhere that people can print out is there a standard like template sign on your website anywhere i I know there isn't on ours yet, but it seemed like a good idea. Yeah, I, I've just got one that I use quite often that's just tweaked. So yeah, I, I can make that available to anybody who emails me. Um, it's not it's not actually on our website um, at the moment, no. We did used to have one, but um, it's not at the moment. Cool. Logos changed and all that, and so. <laughs> um, Mark has put in the chat, can we have that email again? Are you happy for me to put your, when I send out the slides after today, mm. If I copy you in, then everyone will have your email address. Is that all right? Yeah, yeah, that's great. Perfect. Uh, right, the next question says, we have areas of brambles that just go rampant and areas of grass that have been cut for years. So one, how is it best to control the brambles whilst leaving enough for wildlife? And two, how long will it take for wildflowers to come back and look good, not just like an unloved wasteland? So a two part question about brambles and grass. Okay, thanks, Joe. Yeah, brambles. Okay, we have areas. That, so brambles are good for some wildlife, like the hedgehogs, birds, um, mammals, that kind of thing. So that's great. The only thing is, as we'll discuss in tomorrow's webinar, um, churchyards are remnants of ancient grassland. They're incredibly important rare habitats. Brambles can be anywhere. They really can be anywhere. They can grow anywhere, but what they're replacing in your particular site is incredibly rare ancient habitat so we do really would prefer brambles to be really kept to the side and not encroach in the grassland so if you've got some fine 
but don't let them get any bigger. Don't let them encroach into what is a really important grassland. It's not really appropriate. It's a churchyard. Um, in, if it is, if there's too many, and also it, it's not good for what what is particularly good in, in that area. Because conservation is always about a balance, isn't it? Usually something loses and something wins. In this situation, we really want the grassland to win. We don't really want the brambles to win, even though I know they're good for hedgehogs, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a balance. So first of all, Joe, don't let the brambles get any more. Um, if you cut them back regularly from the edge, then you might be able to push them back a bit. I don't know how big your churchyard is. I mean, I've been to sites which are over 100 acres. If they've got brambles, great, that's fine. They can cope with brambles. Um, but when you've got a little churchyard that's maybe only you know, quarter of an acre, then I really would keep brambles as, uh, to just maybe the shaded areas where the wildflowers wouldn't really grow anyway. Okay, so if you, if you're, so it sounds like you're, re, you're wanting to reclaim a bit of the grassland, maybe from the bramble area, maybe, or from something else. Um, the way to do that is to get your cutting regime right. Um, wildflowers like low nutrients, so you need to cut your grass and remove, cut your grass and remove, and cut it and remove and keep doing it. Then the nutrients in your soil go down and then you're more likely to get, well, then you will get more of the flowers. Um, that's if you've got a bit of a perennial seed sort of bank there anyway. If you haven't, and we'll cover that tomorrow, if you haven't got anything there, um, then what you can do is what we do sometimes is turf transplants. So Obviously, if you've got brambles there, you don't want to be carrying them to another part of your churchyard. But if it's just bare soil that's a bit boring um, and it's not in the shade, because if it's in the shade, then flowers won't thrive anyway, then you can dig just a spade, like, you know, obviously not too deep because we're in a churchyard, but a spade uh, of turf from one area that's species rich and take, swap it with a spade of turf area that is not species rich. And then those species will hopefully start thriving in that area. But of course, like, so you don't want to swap bad species like brambles or Japanese knotweed into a good area, obviously. And if it's a very shaded area, then probably they're not gonna cope anyway. Um, so you do need to, to choose the right area that you want wildflowers to grow. So low nutrients, not by compost heap, um, not by a spoil heap, that all you're gonna get is brambles and bracken um, and docks um, and not in a shaded area. So do be do be clear, do be careful about where you're trying to re-establish wildflowers because some areas just it's a bit of an uphill battle. Um, yeah. So the next question is from Mary. We have an enthusiastic and long-established team of five chaps who care for the churchyard. Last year we had a meeting between PCC and team and thought we had agreed a rewilding plan care on the word rewilding um, <laughs> but their desire to deal with long grass cow past etc saw the same mowing at the end of May as usual any ideas to get them to be less tidy so this is more about people isn't it rather than about mm -hmm. it's not about what they want to do it's about convincing people who just so their desire to deal with long grass cow past etc saw the same mowing at the end of May as usual okay did you start, I think in this situation, Mary, it's really good, and you might have done this, so sorry if I'm saying something that you've already done, but maybe just for other people as well, is that when we meet with, with let's call them eager mower men, okay? So when we meet with our fabulous volunteers that have been patted on the back and cheered for years for keeping the burial ground really beautiful um, and short, uh, then it's really hard for them to kind of go back from that because their sense of a good job has, has been upheld by the community telling them that it's great for many years. Um, also, we're really relying on them to carry on because we can't probably um, you know, afford a contractor. And also we appreciate what they've done. Um, so it's a really conflict of interest, isn't it? But however, we really want them to just slightly change. And I think that's the key here, Mary, is asking them only to slightly change what they're doing. So, so rather than sort of a big area to change, we kind of literally mark out. Some, some, some eager mowers are so eager that, that, that if it's not marked out, they just can't help themselves. So I would always, if I think there's quite a lot of resistance from the volunteer mowers or contractors sometimes if we're dealing with councils, then I would just mark it out 
with um, string and kind of um, hazel sticks or something and put that little sign on again saying we are leaving this and you need to go there before May before they start cutting and do that and small to begin with choose your area again not in the shade not high nutrients and um, tomorrow I'll show you how to look at turf and even if the flower isn't flowering if you've got lots of different leaf shapes you know that that's biodiverse so you do need to choose your area otherwise you get them to leave it and all you get is sort of <laughs> not very good stuff um, and that that can be a bit disheartening um, so I think that is the main thing also what we need to remember is don't leave it to grow long for too long once it's flowered they're not annuals they're perennials they don't need to set seed so if your grass is looking a little bit long droopy and starting to die back sort of in in July and you wanted to leave it till August cut it in July and as soon as it's looking messy just cut it because because that if it is looking messy then it's probably too nutrient rich and by cutting it and taking it off you're doing it a favor anyway but we sometimes get people saying, oh, no, you must leave the flowers until they set seed. Well, one, you don't because they're perennials. Two, it looks messy. So you're going to get complaints. And three is what I've just said. And I've just gone and forgotten because I need a drink of water. What was it? Uh, oh, three, you're get, letting the nutrients go back. So, uh, so you're letting the nutrients go back and you're getting complaints. So you don't really want to be leaving it to grow too long. So that's why the five year plan, you really need to adapt it because some people, if they leave their grass 12 weeks, it looks horrific. Some people like down in Sussex, they can leave their grass 12 weeks. And it looks still gorgeous and short and really diverse. So you do need to adapt it to your site. You're full of practical wisdom, aren't you, Andrea? <laughs> Lovely to hear. Uh, Oh, this is a very useful question. Um, there's a question here about faculty. So are there any plans for churchyards change that need faculty? Um, and there are some, aren't there? For churchyard, uh, you, we haven't come across that for um, anything to do with the grassland. Cutting regimes, no. Repair memorials, yes. Putting up big interpretation permanent boards, yes, you would need faculty. Some dioceses want a faculty for rebuilding dry stone walls. We've done about 23 rebuilds of dry stone walls with volunteers. And um, most dioceses don't want that because if you're replacing like for like, they don't mind as long as you take photos before, during, after and use the same stone. Um, so it all depends really. Um, yeah, um, it all depends on what we're referring to as whether a faculty, but it would just be a matter of putting it past the archdeacon. I'll put in the chat um, a link through to the faculty rules. If you, I mean, not now, but later, if you click through on that link, it takes you through to all of the things which are in list A. So you can just get on and do them. And you can scroll down to the section on churchyards and trees. And it shows you what things can be done under list A. And then if you keep going, you get down to list B and list B are the ones where you would need to get permission from the Archdeacon. And if they're not on list A or list B, then you need the full faculty. And I think in most, I'm pretty sure, for example, if you want to install a veg bed, because that's building a structure, then that needs faculty. There are some rules about trees um, because trees can cause harm to the building. Um, quite a few works on trees require faculty. But if you have a look through it, list A and list B, um, or you can go onto your own diocesan website and search through there for the faculty rules. The link I've put through is to like a national, the national listing. Uh, right. The next question says, is there a relationship between caring for God's acre and rough around the edges? I don't know what rough around the edges is. is it, it, might, it sounds like it might be a verges project. If so, we do have connections with plant life and we do have connections with various um, verges projects um, across the UK and with the National Trust. So um, I'm not sure whether rough around the edges is a specific thing, but we do have connections with verges projects. We're 
using a lot of churchyards that we've been involved in um, managing for quite a few years that have got really rich wildflowers, um, rich in wildflowers and lots of seeds. We're collecting the seeds with volunteers and we're using those seeds to regenerate verges and roundabouts and um, other areas of the locality. So that, that, that is things that we are doing. So maybe that's what you mean. Um, we've done that one, we've done that one. Next up, this is about grass again. So if you decide you want to leave that for, for the grass webinar, then, then do feel free. But this one says, our short grass around the graves is regularly strimmed, which means that the grass isn't cleared away. Does this affect the flourishing of wild flora? Um, and I think the answer to that is yes, isn't it? Because you want yeah. all the things cleared. So Maggie, yes, it definitely does. Um, if you're thinking of having places, if you're thinking of dedicating areas to wildflowers in the future, then start now cutting and clearing away, cutting and clearing away, cutting and clearing away. The mulching mower is a really big no-no if you want um, wildflowers and so is just leaving it. However, as um, if you're always going to be cutting the graves short around short, but, well, I suppose if you're always going to be cutting short in that area, it's not such a big deal. So uh, it's only if you're going to start to regenerate it for wildflowers that you need to be getting those clippings off. Yeah, because you probably wouldn't be having the wild flora right around the graves, would you? So actually, yeah. the clippings there less of an issue because you choose a different area for for the wildflower. I mean, ideally, clear clippings off everything. But if you're going to create to target your energies, clear it off the areas you want the wildflowers. Uh, question for Christina: Will you record all of these? Yep, yep. We're recording all of the webinars. It'll take us a few days to get us on the website. Take a few days to get them on the website because we've got twelve webinars in a week. Uh, but they will be up there on our website. And when I send you round the slides and the links, um, the link through, I'll make it clear which one will take you to the page that'll have the recordings on it. Uh, right. Can parishes and benefices become members? I assume that means become a member of uh, Caring for God's Acre. Oh yeah, yes. We have a parish. Uh, we have a group membership where you get more resources to to share around. So the next question says, in your photo, there were lots of men. We have a predominantly older congregation, mostly ladies. Any ideas how to recruit? Hmm. Are my photos full of men? That's interesting, isn't it? I haven't noticed that. Thank you, Hilary. I'll, I'll... We've got volunteers going out and they are 50-50 men and women. In fact, I think it's a few more women. So that's interesting. So you've got a predominantly older congregation, mostly ladies. Any ideas how to recruit? I don't think it would be any different, really. I mean, interestingly, we don't use mechanised machinery when we go out with our volunteers. So working with volunteers, recruiting people, why do people want to look after your burial ground? It might be that they want to socialise. It might be that they want a relaxing day. They want to get out of the house. They want to listen to the birds. They probably don't come just to get the job done. So we quite often split the volunteers so that people with strimmers and mowers come on a different day than our volunteers, than other volunteers. Because otherwise, if you're a volunteer and you turn up on a Saturday because your church has said, come and help, come and help, and there's strimmers going off for two hours, you're probably not going to come back. And although the people with strimmers are really welcome and they're volunteers too and really valued and need tea and cake and looking after and celebrating, they just don't mix with the average person wanting to come along, meet people in their community, that kind of thing. So first of all, recruiting people, I do think you need to think about what is their motivation? Why would they want to volunteer? Why would they want to come and work in our churchyard? And therefore, how can we make that as nice an experience as possible to get them along, but more importantly, to keep them coming back? Um, so that's my top tips. We have got a whole webinar on how to involve volunteers. Um, so maybe sign up to our newsletter and in the autumn, we'll be running those webinars again. But I think it's thinking about the motivations is a big thing and then creating an atmosphere where people want to come and when people want to come back. Tea, cake, beginning and end, make sure somebody friendly welcomes people, make sure they thank them at the end, get their contact details, 
um, you know, keep them informed of what's going on, all that kind of thing. Um, I would say as well, so um, where I live, I'm very involved with the local environmental charity and we have a newsletter that goes out once a month to a whole load of local people who are interested in environmental things. So it might be worth you researching in your area what other groups and organisations there are and then saying to them, could you put in your newsletter this month that we're doing a work party? Um, and so reach out to people who are environmentally minded uh, that way. Depend you'll, you'll know your own area and whether there's any local groups which are which are of, of relevance. Um, so the next thing is a is sort of a top tip rather than a, a question. It says, I have found Google Lens on photos of species to be helpful in identification. So, mm, great. That, yeah, no, I haven't tried that. I have been trying. I haven't got my phone here. It's an app called Seek, S-E-E-K. Um, and that's been really good as well. And that's a free app. And you just hover it and take a photo. Um, it's not very good at daisies because there's so many to mix up, but most things like vetches uh, and that kind of thing, um, it does really well. So yeah, the apps are really good, actually, really good. I wonder if I'm just looking it up to see if I could find it by iNaturalist. Is that yes. found the right one? There you go, right, we'll put that in the chat. Uh, so the next question from Judith says, I'm going to broaden it out slightly from this question. This says, do you have any tips on the kind of area to leave for medium length grass? But there's probably a broader question that in your step, your step two, you said, um, no, in step three of planning what you want to do. It's kind of pointing at that, isn't it? How do you do that step of thinking, OK, we've got our base map. How do we decide what's short grass, what's long grass, what's mm. medium grass, what's mm. wildlife? How, how should people think through that process? OK, so in terms of... Uh... The grass the, the first thing i would do is decide where we need short because people visit graves okay that's the absolute priority that you know is that this is needs to be a fit place uh for people visiting their loved ones at. so where they so that area to me would be short or maybe medium because people need access don't they and feel that they're not trudging through long grass to get to it some people are absolutely fine and they'll say look you know i've got some some churches i work with there's visited graves and they request that, that, that the area is left long around their granddad who loved oxide daisy. So, you know, there's, but in general, if it's being visited, keep that short. And um, then with medium grass, so what medium grass is, I know it sounds really weird, doesn't it? So what it is, is every time you cut, higher the bar of the mower to about 10 centimeters. So it's, you can cut just as often, but you're leaving this much grass rather than scalping it each time because, what looks untidy <laughs> is that, that some bits are long and some bits are short. So you will find that even if you cut it at 10 centimetres, even though it's 10 centimetres, it looks very tidy to people because it's all even. It's like it's been hoovered, OK? But what you'll get then is you'll get really beautiful, in most places, you'll get really beautiful um, flowers because they're, because they're not being chopped off every week and they're low-growing low flowers you will get quite often a carpet of different clovers and trefoils, and maybe even little vetches down there. And so you end up with a really pretty, pretty sway of grass that looks neat because it's being cut regularly to 10 centimeters, uh, but you can have that anywhere. So you can have that around the visited graves if you want, because it is quite short, or you can have it along paths, or you can have it instead of areas that other sites might think were appropriate for long grass. And with long grass, it needs to be, you know, in an area where you are going to get flowers. So, again, not in the high nutrient rich areas and not under shade. Um, and like I say, if you go and look at the turf, there's lots of different leaf shapes. Then you can decide that that's probably going to be nice for, for a wide variety of species. And then there's kind of different guidelines, like if you have an area of long grass, then on the map, I would plan to have a, a path through that so that people can see it's actively managed. And also, if you have long grass, then don't have it long right up to the sides of any paths, like a tarmac path. Keep that medium or short so that people can see that that long area is being actively managed and not neglected. And also, you don't get all the seeds on the tarmac, which is a bit of a pain as well. Um, so, yeah. Wonderful. How are we doing? We've got, I think we've got time for one more question. Um, from 
Bernard, do you publish notices on site with a churchyard code? similar to the countryside code without making it prohibitive to visitors, but an oasis of calm and a place to relax away from traffic and bustle to listen to birdsong and nature. That paints a beautiful image, doesn't it? Yeah, I want to be there, Bernard. I want to come to your churchyard. <laughs> is, there, is there an equivalent to a, a churchyard code or no. some sign to have on the gate saying that this is a, a calm and peaceful place? People do, yeah, people do, but I, ha well, I haven't... Um, written one myself but but groups do yeah absolutely it's part of that kind of planning what do we want the place to be how do we want to invite people in and make them feel comfortable um so yes i ha i haven't i've seen various ones um but i haven't got one myself and the key thing is have enough benches because i think we do underestimate how many people need to sit down by the time they've walked to the burial ground i think there's a lot of accessibility issues with the countryside and sometimes churches maybe only have one or two benches, and particularly now with COVID, investing in a few more benches, I think, would be really valuable so that people can sit down, listen to birdsong and nature. So I think, with apologies to those of you that have got questions still on the queue, but I'm conscious we're coming up on five o'clock, so I think I'd better stop us there. Um, just a reminder, so we've, I mean, we've got webinars, we've got two or three a day every day this week, but the particular ones that have come up today, so there's the blooming and beautiful flower rich grasslands and a lot of your questions have been about that. So you might well want to come to that one that's four o'clock tomorrow afternoon. There's also at noon tomorrow, there's a session being run by a panel of churches from Bristol Diocese about the practical things that they've done in their own churchyard. So that one I think could be of real interest. Um, then uh, later in the week, we've got the Devon Living Churchyards project, which again is about managing your churchyard for, for people and for nature. We have got then at four o'clock on Friday, there's one about how to do the biological recording. So if you've been out and you've been making records mm -hmm. and you want to know how do you actually do the recording, how do you catalogue the different species, how do you get them onto the system, that's four o'clock on Friday. So um, hopefully uh, you can all make it along to one of those or um find the videos when they're up on our website uh, after a few days uh thank you so much andrea for your yes just incredible depth of practical experience on this topic which you which you've brought to bear um mm -hmm. in a really accessible way so thank you so much uh, thank you to everyone who's joined our webinar today i'll send you out now the slides and the links and um, Andrew's email address so that if there was anything in there where you need, wanted to follow up you are free to to go right ahead and do that thank you very much I'll just save the chat and then I'll bring us to a close bye everyone bye thank you